Filmmaker in Focus is a project of the Maine Outdoor Film Festival. This summer, Portland, Maine hosts the 2022 Maine Outdoor Film Festival. Three weekends of outdoor films shown outdoors at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, the Eastern Promenade, and APRE. So, whether you spend your day on the trail, ocean, in the mountains, or enjoying Portland's many cultural and culinary options, we'll see you at MOF in the evenings. Each night will feature a shorts block or a feature length film related to outdoor adventure or conservation from some of Maine and the world's best adventure filmmakers. Mark your calendars. Advanced tickets go on sale April 1st. We're here on a scientific expedition with the Blue Latitudes Foundation to research and better understand the relationship between the Tongan people and the humpback whales here. We decided to come down to Tonga because here we've got this incredible ecotourism operation meeting with one of the most sensitive forms of the environment, humpback whale breeding ground, the nursery ground for these whales. So we wanted to ask the question, is that relationship actually sustainable? The Blue Lagoon Resort, it's an eco resort, trying to minimize all the plastic, the single-use plastic. So it's a resort run by a little local family, so I'm one of them. We are sitting at uh, an island in Tonga Vavau at the Pacific. Tonga is a um, magical place. It's um, pretty much untouched. Uh, a lot of things you can do here. Tonga is a beautiful little country in the Pacific. So magical and good to come over and swim with humpback whales, get some cover, and enjoy. These brothers. They've been our whale tour guides, essentially, this whole time, driving the boats, the baby flew there. Um, taking us out to the whales, guiding us in the water with the whales, and also teaching us about the local population here. And these brothers that work and live here at the Blue Lagoon are potentially the face of the new generation of conservation here in Tonga. And they are one of the few licensed tour guides that are actually Tongan. Whales is, it's like being on a safari, but underwater. With an animal, you're close up, they're massive, and 
you never really know what type of characteristics you're gonna get. Some are shy and sink to the bottom, some are super playful, come up, look you in the eye. It's, it's a really cool experience. It just when was my first time hopping in the water with them, you know, how gentle they are, how humongous they are, but such a gentle animal, you know. I don't know, you gotta come and do it to know the experience. It's just mind-blowing and it was pretty amazing. I was so shocked, like, whoa, so huge. The humpback whale is a size of a bus with a three meters long wing on the side. And if you earn their trust, they will let you closer and closer. And having the calf, you know, comes shooting up to the surface and they have blue eyes and they lock eyes with you. They're watching you um, and they get so close to you, but they're, they know exactly where you are in the water and they won't hit you. You have the sensation of, you know, being the other kids in the schoolyard and the whale comes up to play with you before going back down to check in with mom to make sure everything's okay. And honestly, we have as much fun as the whale calf, I think. Swimming with the humpback whales here in Tonga is one of the most human interactions I've ever experienced in the natural environment. It's almost like you can relate to all the emotions that you're witnessing. What we found is that it's more complicated than we thought. Um, not only is ecotourism something that doesn't occur year-round, it's only when the humpback whales are here, um, but it's also from that sense not sustainable because then you're unemployed for seven, eight months of the year. Uh, oh, so for our income for our, our now pretty much it's come from, from whale, whale watching. Uh, pretty much I would say maybe, pretty much say yeah, 100% out of it. Here in Tonga, because ecotourism is so hyper-focused on the whales and they're only here for such a short season, there are bound to be some issues that arise from that. And we went to the town of Vava'u to get some answers. With our economy, especially from tourism, is very vulnerable because if the whales don't come here anymore, what's next? Are we prepared for that? Um, I know in the last 10 years since I've been here, there was a lot of complaints from some of the uh, people who own restaurants and also accommodation. They said that basically what the whale watching season have done to their business is narrowing down the, the season to only effectively three to four months. In the early days, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, literally it was all year round for them. So what they do, they have to manage and budget to be able to operate the whole year. So a lot of the small businesses that I found around here in Bavao will only operate for them, close the business, go overseas, work, and then come back reopen. But over here when uh, low season is, I go to Hunga. It's a village where my mom comes from. In Hunga, is, uh, everybody is so much caring and they respect for who you are. And everybody's so lovable there. So there's no place like Hunga. A lot of the Hunga people during season or low season, they go to overseas, to Australia, New Zealand, picking fruits. They get a little bit of income there and come and help with the family in the island. I 
Foi fim a pé que é o que é o Oca. Aqui já foi a quando me pia com a vaca pia que toma e algo que tofo a time de fama tá e aí. É menino malunga pega toco varo algo que foi pior ou toco fa pia que vai pia fama tá. Foi vaca pego foi o que. Malahi. I can probably say there are too many licenses, all right? There are too many licenses at present, and I think there's also issues uh, because most of the world watching uh, licenses are foreign owned. Very few is owned by Tongans. More, probably 70% was owned by foreigners, you know, but then this is the other side of the view. But at the same time, most of all the skippers uh, all the tour guide in the uh, world watching businesses are local Tongans. During the season, the hard parts is uh, everybody's out there like met plenty boats. And then the hard part is you have to be there early to get the whale before some other boats on the whale. There's 23 operators and most of them have like two boats. It's uh, very sad to see it because uh, we want the whales to come every year like, because this is for us, our business and life, you know. Until you finish your one and a half hour and you think the whale will have a rest, but now they hop straight in. And that is one of the hardest part just to try to give the whales a break too. Uh, more uh, people come here for photographer and stuff like that and they're trying to harass the whale, trying. So I'm watching um, pretty much if they can stop the licensing, just cut it down, try to make it less. Yeah, there's one word called uh, faka apa apa in Tonga. It's uh, very important. That's the, one of the important things here in Tonga is faka apa apa is respect. Like you always doesn't matter if you're wrong or right, you can't uh, talk bad back to your dad or mom or somebody older than you, you know. You know, that was, that's how respectful here in Tonga. I do feel uh, respect to the whales. If the whales don't come back one year, I think that it could very easily just fall apart. I think ecotourism here is kind of vulnerable because it's only relying on one thing and that's if the whales come.
Emily, thank you so much for joining me today for this interview. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, of course. Happy to be here. So I have just a few questions for you today. First off, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you came to be involved with this film? Sure. So um, I'm a marine conservation biologist and um, I run a small nonprofit, the Blue Latitudes Foundation. And for a long time, we've collaborated with Matador Network to um, go on different expeditions around the world. This is our second documentary film together. Um, but basically what we try to highlight with Matador Network is areas of our oceans where um, industry and environment have intersected. And that's where we find a lot of these interesting stories to tell. Um, and Tonga was an excellent example of that, where we saw um, a, a culture that had shifted from hunting these humpback whales to now protecting them and swimming with them and um, understanding the story that goes on behind that and uh, some of the challenges they've been facing. Yeah, I was going to ask what brought you specifically to Tonga? Is their challenge unique in any way? Or are you seeing this happening a lot around the globe? Tonga is very unique. Um, they're facing, you know, a lot of the same issues that small island nations that are facing with climate change and rising sea levels. And, you know, they're also very, very isolated. So um, it's very expensive for them to import goods and things like that. Most Tongans actually leave the island um, to go look for work, um, especially when the whales are not there. So we selected Tonga because it's one of only two areas on the planet where you can actually swim with humpback whales. But what's um, also unique about Tonga is that up until the late 1970s, they used to hunt humpback whales for income and as a, a source of food. And um, that shifted. And once there became a ban on humpback whale hunting, they really lost a big source of income. Um, and that was something that we learned in the process of making this film. I think anytime you make a film, you start to have more questions than when you came into the project to begin with. And we were pretty surprised to you know, even think about this other side of the coin of what does a small isolated island nation do when it's so dependent on one source? You know, It used to be dependent on the whales for income and meat, and now it's still dependent on the whales for income, but now through ecotourism. And so that's what really drew us to this project. So at first glance, it definitely seems like ecotourism and having tourists swim with the whales is 100% a better option than having them be hunted. But um, could you speak to some of the negative effects, if there are any, of humans constantly being in the whale's environment and disrupting it in that way? Yeah, of course. I mean, ecotourism, like most industries, there can always be a dark side. Um, you know, there's, of course, the general idea of ecotourism is fantastic. You know, you're protecting these whales, allowing people to interact with these whales in hopefully a healthy way. But you do run into these issues. And what we highlight in the film is in Tonga, a lot of the licenses are foreign owned. And that brings a lot of income to foreign countries and not to the Tongans themselves. Um, so that was a big issue that we identified was, you know, that many of the licenses were not actually Tongan owned to go swim with these whales. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're also talking about an area that's a very sensitive habitat. It's where these whales come to breed and give birth and you worry about too much pressure on the whales and if that's going to um, prohibit these whales from coming back in the future and what we found is that at least those um, Tongan tour guides that were licensed to swim with the whales there they were very protective and we were very grateful for our own guides that you know they were very respectful of the whales which is where that title of the film comes from Faka Apa Apa um, and most recently what's been a really interesting shift and one that we didn't really think about was with COVID. You know, we always in the film, we were questioning what happens if the whales don't come back? And in this situation, it was what happens if the people don't come back? And that's your sense of source of income. Um, so that <clears throat> it's really a multi-layered um, project, but it's it continues to evolve and change, which has really been interesting for us. In your experience, what was the general attitude that the locals had towards this increase in tourists coming to Vavau? Um, in general, the tourists were really excited to see us. And um, I think what we actually picked up on was, you know, I think you get the sense of a lot of people go to Tonga as a bucket list and they don't return. And um, a lot of the guides, especially the ones that we were working with at the Blue Lagoon, they were like, I hope you guys come back. Everybody says they're going to come back, but they don't usually come back. And and it's true in our case, we were planning a second trip then and uh, there and COVID hit. So we weren't able to go down there for a second time. Um, but in general, everybody was so friendly. I mean, 
the ethos of the Tongan people is some of the warmest culture, one of the warmest cultures I've ever interacted with. That's great to hear. Um, is there a best case scenario where both the Tongans and the whales could be thriving consistently? And how do you think if that if something like that could be enacted with specific regulations, is there any idea that you would have in mind? Oh, absolutely. I think there's definitely a way to have a healthy balance. Um, you know, it, COVID, it's unfortunate that it's impacting the income of Tongans right now, but it is giving those whales a break. Um, I think most critically, it would be to get more of these licenses to swim with the whales in the hands of Tongans. And the way to do that, I think, would be through government grants, um, because often it's the barrier to entry, which makes it challenging. You need to have a boat. You know, you need to have, you know, your own shop to get people to come into and encourage tourism and your own website and things. That tends to be the barrier for entry versus these foreign entities that come in with a lot of money. Um, so I think getting uh, more licenses in the hands of Tongans, but also broadening and diversifying the opportunities for ecotourism there. You know, it's, everybody knows Tonga pretty much only for the humpback whales, but the diving there is spectacular. You know, there's over a hundred islands, so there's so much to explore there. So I think being able to bring in more of an industry in terms of tourism, um, other ways to engage uh, with the outside world to bring more people in, not just through the whales, would also be very beneficial. Lastly, uh, is there anything that you wish and you've seen across your storytelling and just your general experience in marine biology that you wish people would be more aware of when it comes to marine life or conservation in general? I think, you know, I, I think most critically when it comes to our oceans, we're going to have to start to think more creatively about ocean conservation. And um, we're going to have to start to think outside the bounds of traditional conservation practices because it ends up not being as effective. Um, and I think we're seeing that with the Tongans. It's, it's very new, um, this practice of swimming with the humpbacks, but it's an excellent opportunity for the Tongans to still garner and make money off of these whales, but also bring in the outside world. You know, seeing is believing, especially when you get these opportunities to swim with the whales. It's, I mean, talk about an opportunity to interact with an animal that you wouldn't normally be able to and have a very human-like connection with. It's a great way to get people to interact with the natural world and start to care about it. You know, with knowing comes caring. And I think with, with that, as a doctor, Sylvia Earle said, there's hope for the future of our oceans. Wonderful. It's been really great speaking with you today, Emily. I really appreciate you coming in, or not coming in, coming into the virtual room here. Thank you so much for having me.